Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live State Delegation Update for July 2nd, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. Welcome back, State Representative Mike Conley, State Representative Denise Provo. How are each of you this afternoon? Fine, thanks, and yourself? Terrific, Rep Conley. Doing well, Joe. Great to be here with you and Rep Provo. Who would have thought all these months later we would still be doing our weekly update? Um, it is July 2nd, and before we go, I want to wish everybody a very, very safe holiday weekend. I know there's no extensive travel by a, for a lot of us, but uh, it might be a perfect time to take a breather. Um, I know that the uh, State House has been working diligently on the state budget, but before we get into that, there's a couple of things that both of you have been working on. Um, Rep Conley, why don't we start off with the housing bill? And then Rep Provo, if you want to join in on that, please do. Mike? Sure, yeah. Well, thank you, Joe. And uh, yeah, thank you for uh, diligently working to uh, bring us live to the people of Somerville throughout this pandemic. Um, this morning, um, I was standing right in the spot when we hosted uh, an online briefing uh, to talk about new legislation we filed. Um, it's called the COVID-19 Housing Stability Act. And it's really intended uh, to follow up on the progress we made with the eviction and foreclosure moratorium. Uh, the bill was filed in the House by myself and House Housing Chair Kevin Honan. And it was filed in the Senate by Somerville Zone Pat Jalen. Um, and so we're, we're grateful our entire Somerville legislative de delegation um, is supporting the bill. Uh, so thank you to Rep Provo and Rep Barber um, for signing on. And really this was something, we started working on it even before the eviction uh, and foreclosure moratorium was passed into law. People started naturally asking the question, well, great, you know, I'm glad we're working on this moratorium but what will happen if uh, individual tenants, when individual tenants owe several months worth of rent, won't we see um, a wave of evictions? And so just this week, I think the sort of public focus on this issue has really been amplified. Uh, City Life Vita Urbano, which is one of the great um, housing justice organizations in our area, they commissioned a study um, engaging with folks from MIT and the Department of Urban Studies and Planning there uh, to look at where eviction happens. And what they found was really um, striking that, you know, evictions are predominantly and disproportionately impacting uh, black communities, people of color, um, neighborhoods uh, where people of color live uh, are where we see the disproportionate incidents of eviction filings. Um, in addition, you know, a study came out this week, it was featured in the Boston Globe, uh, that revealed the just shocking and abhorrent uh, racial discrimination that we see um, in sort of the apartment search process and in people who are looking to utilize housing vouchers. So really, um, you know, Congresswoman Presley and I did a, a town hall meeting last week, and she talks about the pandemic within the pandemic, um, referring to both this ongoing COVID-19 pandemic alongside uh, the continuing uh, impact of systemic racism. So that's sort of the um, background. And if you'd like, I could walk you through briefly uh, what the legislation will do. Um, yeah, Mike, if you, don't, if you don't mind the highlights of what the bill is designed to do. Sure, yeah. And thanks for saying highlights, because you know me. I could probably start now and we would be here on the 4th of July and I'd still be telling you about it. <laughs> it would be so, a Ken Burns documentary. It would, it would. <laughs> so um, I don't want to go on too much. But, um, you know, the big theme is we need to maintain housing stability. You know, the governor announced today uh, that we will be starting phase three of the reopening on Monday. Um, however, we know uh, clearly we are not out of the woods 
with this pandemic. And unfortunately, uh, as we look around the country, we see most states are headed in the exact wrong direction. And it's probably, I just got off the phone with a, a, a doctor um, who was talking about these policy issues. And, you know, he was saying he fully expects uh, a resurgence is very likely here in Massachusetts as well. And so the theme of the bill is for us to say, we need to preserve and protect and guarantee housing stability um, for the duration of this emergency situation and for a full year uh, continuing after the emergency ends. And as we did with the eviction and foreclosure moratorium, you know, we propose to do this in a holistic way where we're thinking about tenants and about homeowners and also landlords, and this bill even goes further than our previous effort in offering more uh, supports to landlords. Because what we've found is that when you approach it in that holistic way, you really have the ability to build coalitions that can hopefully uh, make things happen. And so real briefly, and I think this will help address some concerns that have come up in Somerville, and I know Rep. Provost uh, can share those with us, um, the legislation would cancel rent as the basis of eviction for those who have been impacted by COVID-19. And so by that, we mean if you owe several months rent and you have been impacted directly or indirectly, then a court won't recognize that inability to pay as the basis of an eviction action. Mike, In addition- I, Mike, if I could ask one question about that, because people have asked me about it before. So if an eviction proceeding was started through the courts in January of 2020, would those folks also be protected? Um, under the provision I just described, um, no, in terms of owing back rent, because that back rent would have come prior to the state of emergency, However, they are currently protected from eviction by the current eviction moratorium, recognizing the public health crisis. Okay, yeah, thank um, you, yeah. And then real briefly, and um, I'll run through a couple of the other key things. So that was our starting point, is how do we prevent this wave of eviction? And we know the moratorium could end as soon as August 18th. And so wanting to prevent back rent is being used as the basis of eviction for COVID impacted tenants was the first piece. From there, we also include just cause eviction protections. And this speaks to the case where a landlord may just decide, you know, I'm just not gonna renew the lease. And our position is that in this emergency situation, um, we, you know, can't tolerate displacement. We also have a freeze on rents in our proposal. We say that you can't raise the rent beyond what it was the day that the state of emergency started on March 10th. And finally, on the tenant side, we also protect against things like negative credit reporting and late fees. And we also protect against court records because we know it can be devastating for a tenant to have an eviction, even if the eviction doesn't get approved by the court, just the matter that it's filed can be counted against you and prevent you from access in future housing. And you may never know that from the, the new landlord that you're going to, because of course they do checks, they do a credit check, they do everything else. They may never tell you the basis of us not renting to you is because you had an eviction proceeding taken against you. We don't care if you want a lost. Yeah. Correct. I, I yeah. And, that, and of course, you know, that really cuts against due process and, and this is against the backdrop of that systemic and overt racism that already throws up barriers to, to people of color in particular who are trying to access uh, the housing market. And then uh, on, the, on the ownership side, we, will, we propose to further extend the foreclosure moratorium, again, looking to have it run for the duration of the emergency plus a year, particularly for those who have been impacted we further propose to extend the mortgage deferment um, opportunity that would allow someone with a mortgage payment, if they can't make it, to tack that payment on at the very end of the mortgage, often years into the future. We propose 
expanding the availability of that mortgage deferment to landlords of 15 units or less. And that's a significant broadening of the current availability of that mortgage deferment benefit. Uh, in addition, we are proposing a housing stabilization fund that could be used to help fill in some of the gaps with the existing programs like RAFT to help address some of these um, back rent issues. Uh, we also propose, this really speaks to tenants and homeowners, of making housing court the exclusive jurisdiction to resolve any back rent issues because uh, advocates feel like that is a more favorable venue um, for a homeowner or a renter. And then finally, we propose an oversight committee that will have strong representation of communities that have been most impacted, both geographically, um, as well as we know, black people, Latin, Latinx people, people of color have seen disproportionate COVID-19 impacts. So that is uh, the bill uh, in summary. I'm pleased to say as of today, we filed it 48 hours ago. We have 55 co-sponsors. Uh, so it seems to be off to a, a strong start. Uh, just this week, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Congresswoman Ayanna Presley both um, have made statements that align with what we're proposing. And for the record, Marty Walsh um, has actually said he supports our bill as well. Um, so it's certainly, um, we'll see what we can do and hoping we can achieve this within the next month before the uh, legislative session could potentially end. So it sounds like an absolutely stellar um, bill that will protect people who, through no fault of their own, have been severely impacted by the COVID pandemic. I want to I want to ask you one quick question, and I'm going to go right right over to Rep. Provo to weigh in on some of the things that she's observed, and hopefully, this bill will protect. So we're looking at basically protecting people from March 10th. And what's the end date on this? What will be the end date of the protection under this bill? Uh, generally, throughout the provisions, the theme is extending the protections for the duration of the state of emergency. And then, you know, and we're not quite sure when that day will come. And then when the, when the emergency is over, having the protections last for one additional year as we look to, you know, do the economic recovery. Got it. Got it. Rep. Provo, you have, uh, you have a very specific incident where um, Mike was making reference to the fact that there are certain unscrupulous landlords out there who know the tricks of the trade. If you want to get rid of tenants, you don't really have to go down the eviction notice. All you have to do is price the rent through the roof. That, that's true. And that's been used a lot in Somerville in recent years. Um, and unfortunately, it's become an end run around the eviction moratorium. There's a 30 unit apartment building on Central Street that was purchased by an investment company out of Chicago. Uh, where the tenants have been given enormous rent increases, which constructively evicts them in the middle of a pandemic, uh, which I think is unconscionable. But you know, we've seen we've seen greed motivate a lot of unattractive um, behaviors in our in our housing market in Somerville and. The human impacts, particularly right now, are devastating. Rep. Provo, with the bill that was filed that you and, and uh, Mike Conley and others have been signing on to, would that bill be retroactive for these, these folks that are getting huge increases? Well, my understanding is that if it were in effect now, it would have helped these tenants because the rent increases came after the declaration of the COVID emergency in March. Um, how many of them may be left in that building um, should the legislation pass is hard to predict. But 
this was this is the the kind of of legal protection that would have kept these folks from from having been cast out at a, a particularly dangerous and difficult time. And I'm, I'm not saying that this applies to all uh, larger real estate investment trusts or conglomerates of folks, but do we see that more prevalent with larger uh, property owners, larger conglomerate property owners than we do with like a triple decker owner or a two family? That's the pattern that I've seen in my district. Um, and in fact, it was, I think, the, the fall of 2016 when a 24 unit apartment building in, in Ward 6 was purchased by an investor. And all of the tenants were either given enormous, in, in that case, mostly they were being told that their, their leases wouldn't be renewed. Um, as well as you know some major interference with with the quiet enjoyment of their premises um, and one of the tenants you know was the people called me up and wanted advice and I said well some of you may um, qualify for legal services which might buy you a little time and one tenant said you know Massachusetts should law should protect tenants in our situation better than it does. And, you know, I thought about that and I did some research and that's when I filed the, the tenants opportunity to purchase bill, which is based on one in Washington, DC. Uh, Somerville has a home rule petition to allow that. That's another remedy that could have been in place for a building like this. Um, the bill stuck in committee. I, I've been trying to get it out along with um, the Somerville, another Somerville home rule petition for a transfer fee and a couple of other bills, including an earlier one that Rep Connolly filed with Rep Allegardo. Um, so, you know, the housing committee has been good. I've been talking to the chairman you know, about reporting bills out of the housing committee that would really make things better during this crisis, but getting them through the house and into law has been more challenging. Challenging, that's, you know, I've known you for many years and when you say challenging, I understand exactly what you mean. You don't mean challenging. You, you have another word off camera for it, but. We, we won't go there on that one. Um, before, we, before we move on off of the housing thing, I wanted to ask a question of um, Rep Conley. When you were making reference to the fact that it is startling where you see what's happening within communities of color, and I'm just interested, I'm always interested in the data, getting down into the data. Are they also reporting out who are the actual owners of these properties? Are they large conglomerates? Are they one developer who happens to own 13 properties in one city? And then going deeper, are they able to tell if these are all either white owned properties, white person properties or people of color properties? I'm always interested to know when it's happening in a, in a community of color, who are those people that are doing this? No, that, it's a fascinating question. Um, in terms of the specific numbers, I think you know we'd need to review the report. Although you know one one issue, there's so many issues that interplay here. The disparity between having legal representation uh, and not is is literally off the charts. I'm looking at some figures right now um, that say that. Um, low, you know, lower income tenants tend to have an 8% rate of having legal representation, um, as opposed to 85% of the landlords show up with legal representation. Uh, there's another bill to add to the list of bills we need to pass that would guarantee a right to counsel, um, which makes all the sense in the world. 
to your point, um, you know, it's, it's white people who, you know, based on 400 years of um, systemic racism, who have accumulated, you know, uh, the lion's share of wealth and property in our society. So I don't have the specific numbers in front of me, but, you know, I do feel like it's pretty safe to say um, that most of the people who own most of these properties uh, are people who are white. Um, the average family of color in the Boston area has a net worth of $8, um, as the Boston Globe reported a few years back. And so that really speaks to the deep uh, divide um, and largely has been, you know, those wealth disparities are largely manifest through housing policies like redlining and others that have excluded home ownership. So um, absolutely, I think, you know, it's a practice that is worse. The bigger you go up the food chain, it's easier for that, you know, corporate giant it's easier for that very large owner uh, to sort of not see and, and feel like the individual human impact isn't really tangible to them. Right. And they don't care. And what they instruct their attorneys and their lawyers is, you know what, just get me my money. So, right. Unfortunately, Rep Provo, you, you, you got something there. Yes, actually, the, the Suffolk University study um, is one where, you know, was a classic housing discrimination one where, where they had, they, they sent eight separate people it, to apply for each apartment in the study. And half were white and half were black. And there were, you know, there were other differentiating factors, variables that they were checking for, like whether you had a rental voucher or not. Mm -hmm. They wanted to check that form of discrimination as well. My, what I'm hoping is that they have turned their data over to the Attorney General for enforcement and that down the road, we will find out who the malefactors are. Get them. That's all I can say. Go get them. Let, let me turn to something because we're, we're go, winding down the clock here. Rep. Provo, you want to talk a little bit about the um, COVID safe voting initiative that's out there. Take it away. Yes, yes. That um, on Tuesday of this week, the House voted to um, to enact the the bill that came out of the conference committee that because the House and Senate approaches had some little differences. But the the good news is that um, that we have got to work around for this crazy prohibition in our state constitution that says that voters can't get a no excuse absentee ballot. Um, so we have, we have got a way, however, despite that, that prohibition because of COVID to greatly open up the availability of vote by mail. And the Secretary of State this month is going to be sending every registered voter an application for an absentee ballot for the September primary election. September 1st, it's going to be on us in no time. And then in September, the Secretary of State is going to be sending every voter an application for an absentee ballot for November. So many, many people will be able to avail themselves of vote by mail. We're also having expanded early voting so that we don't get huge crowds. If you remember the last presidential election in Somerville, we had lines around the block. I, I was there. Yes, <laughs> weren't we all? So there's gonna be seven days of early voting for the primary, including one weekend and 14 days of early voting for the final election, <laughs> as well as election day voting that's simplified so it can be more distanced. For instance, the second checker who checks your name and address before you cast your ballot, that's eliminated for this election, so you need fewer people per polling place. So there are gonna be three ways to vote. We wanna make sure everybody does vote and that they're able to do it safely. Excellent job. 
excellent job. I know, as you know, I'm part of the Ward 5 Democratic City Committee, and we have been endorsing. Um, we, we had our thoughts about which bill to endorse, mm -hmm. uh, but we have been endorsing any bill that's coming across that's making it safer and easier and more convenient for voters to vote, whether it's the primary or the general. So kudos to the folks on Beacon Hill for making that work in Massachusetts. Um, before we do run out of time, I wanna ask you a couple of questions. The, um, any word on whether or not the state will be supplementing the P federal PPP um, payroll protection plan? Because as you know, the federal government may or may not renew that. Uh, personally, it's hard to see how the state, which is required by law to balance its budget, would be in a position <coughs> to have the kind of revenue, even for what we might consider the basics. So almost, almost solely based on what the feds are gonna do on that thing. I'm afraid so. Yeah, state budget, when you guys expected to finish that up, mid-July? Well, you know, we adopted a one twelfth budget to get us through the month of July. Mm -hmm. There may be another one twelfth budget for the month of August. I think the idea is that we want to see because, you know, the tax deadline was moved to the middle of July. Right. We want to see what kind of revenues come in. Well, we're hoping we're hoping that there will be another federal bill that will specifically put more resources, make more resources available for state and local government. Um, so right now it's step by step, inch by inch. Great. I want to compliment both of you for the weeks, um, you and your colleagues, Senator Jalen, Representative Barber, for the weeks that you've stuck with it. I know that it, your time is precious, but um, I think by the numbers that we see in the number of viewers and people who, who compliment us, uh, kudos to you folks for sticking with it all these weeks. We have discussed um, taking a little bit of a hiatus from these for the rest of July. Um, although any late breaking developments, any of the state delegation are welcome to come back on. Um, I think everyone deserves a little bit of a rest after you get your budgets uh, done. But as they say in public service, um, no rest for taxpayer jobs. Um, I, one thing I want to remind everybody of, Adam's giving me the countdown here. I just want to remind everybody as we go into a long holiday weekend, Massachusetts has had over 8,000 deaths due to COVID. Middlesex County has had over 1,800 deaths, and that's the county that we live in. City of Cambridge has had over 97 deaths. And the city of Somerville has had over 31 deaths. If I can just say one thing to anybody who watches these programs, July 4th weekend is no different from the March 10th weekend. The virus is out there. The virus is waiting for any one of us to make a mistake. So please, don't be stupid this weekend. Conduct yourselves like it is still there. Have a good one. Spend time with family. But please, as always, stay safe. Stay informed, Rep Conley, Rep Provost, take a rest this weekend and we'll see you next time.